My name is Michael Donahue, and I'm a chemist from the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom, and I've got 40 odd years in the pigment and protective coatings industry. And thank you for joining me today because we're going to deal with a very interesting topic, corrosion under insulation, from the perspective of looking at thermal spray aluminum versus a cold spray aluminum. And we'll explain what that is later, it's a liquid applied coating. Uh, I'd like to begin by mentioning a quote from Carl Sagan. And he said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And I'd like you to keep that in mind as we go through this very short introduction journey, as it were, on corrosion under insulation. First off, if we think of integrity management, and there's many of you who are out there who are process managers, mechanical managers, technical managers dealing with what you have to face in the facility, refineries, petrochemical industry, and um, the oil and gas industry at large, you have a very interesting situation there. And it's been said before by a friend of mine, asset integrity is the mountain we all have to climb. And if you look at uh, asset integrity from the perspective of a triangle, we'll see that there are three things that really hit us quite forcefully. First of all, we can look at the cost, then the performance, and the risk associated with whatever we're doing at the facility. When it comes to cost and the choice of materials that we're going to use, we'd ordinarily like to think we're going to use something that's cheaper, faster, um, easier to use, and all under the umbrella of safety, of course, and keep our costs down. What would we do? And when it comes to performance, well, that's rather like a seesaw. And we in such a way that on one side, on the one hand, we're thinking of performance in terms of the heat resistance, the uh, thermal cycling resistance, and the resistance to thermal shock of the materials that we employ. And on the other hand, on the other side of that seesaw, we're going to think about corrosion and resistance to corrosion. So we need a balance between all of these big factors. Now, when it comes down to risk, this is an interesting one because we're dealing with so many people from all different aspects of the, the projects that we're going to be dealing with, weather, surface preparation, and the conditions that we find in the particular environment of your facility. And then we can ask ourselves a big billion dollar question because CUI, difficult to detect, very, very big in terms of the degradation mechanisms that are going on. And we see corrosion rates 20, 30 times greater than we would in the atmosphere. So what's the billion dollar question, would you say? And that is, where is the least risk in getting the job done right? And that's the big key of what we're going to look at today. Whether it's containment loss, catastrophic failure, equipment going down, equipment being replaced, and so on. There's my least risk. And I hope you enjoy what we're going to look at. So. And when we're thinking about operational conditions with CUI, we can see it almost diagrammatically, as you'll probably see beside me in a moment. And you'll see that there are overlapping circles. The main area of interest, say, for example, in the oil and gas industry, is in the constant running mode, typically between uh, 50 centigrade and 175 centigrade in terms of our interest in the CUI. And that would be typically what we would do. Now, on the other hand, on the outliers, we have thermal shock to deal with and thermal cycling. And you can envision, say, for example, a thermal shock being a pipe. And we'll talk about pipes and vessels and, and valves here. A pipe where the fluid is flowing through at a very hot condition and in very short order, cold solution is going through it, which puts a lot of stress on the external part of the pipe. And this coating then is subject to degradation mechanisms. So there's a number of things going on. And what we're talking about today are materials that can withstand minus 196 centigrade all the way up to plus 400 centigrade with a focus being on maintenance and repair. Yes, you can think of these things too in terms of new construction. But our main focus is on the repair and the maintenance aspects of this CUI endeavor, as it were. So 
let's stop for a moment and scratch our bald spots and think uh, as men who are and scratch our bald spots and say, what is the best material that I can use on the external part of this pipe? Because it's very expensive in my facility. Most of the incidents, even accidents, are all going to occur because of corrosion under insulation. What can I use? A lot of people have used historically thermal spray aluminum. And that's one. But is there a better way? And what else could we do if there was one? That's where we're going to look at a cold spray aluminum technology as well. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So there's those two to think about. We want to go in our plant from uncertainty towards certainty or at least predictability. And unfortunately, when it comes down to corrosion under insulation, some of the tried and true things that we do in the atmospheric realm are not so useful and can bring surprises when we're dealing with corrosion under insulation in that particular realm. So first off, thermal spray aluminum, magnificent stuff. Proven track record, 20 to 40 years atmospheric exposure, phenomenal. And everybody knows that. And it's not very expensive when you look at the life cycle cost of that kind of um, success, right? But then when you start to think of aluminum, technically, and we're going to think of aluminum from thermal spray aluminum from the technical perspective and the practical perspective. When we think of it technically, aluminum is a wonderful, wonderful metal. It loves to give up three electrons. Zinc only gives up two electrons. It's very efficient at what it does as a sacrificial galvanic anode, for example, in the offshore platforms where it's often used as well as bridges and dams and so on. But when it gives up that three electrons, we have to think. Um, for example, it became the rage thermal spray aluminum on hot risers on platforms years ago. The expectation would be, say, for the aluminum, you would have an anode and you would get two years of life from it. Not so. What you often find is in a year, you'd have to replace it twice. That's a factor of four the wrong way around. And it's not a trivial thing to consider, is it? The other thing to think about is that aluminum, giving up that highly efficient three electrons and what have you, when you now go up to 80 centigrade, which you're going to get in the CUI region, right? Then something else happens. It's not good. It's centigrade in hot water, hot brine. And you know as well as I do, we don't go into it. We're getting salts in here. We've got moisture intrusion. We've got oxygen intrusion. And we've got all sorts of things on that surface inside the insulation, cladding on the outside. 80 centigrade is a problem. It's like an Achilles heel. And then the aluminum is not particularly effective. It's consumed. And so we are thinking to ourselves, hmm, I don't have much water in here, do I? It's not like a swimming pool on top of it. I've just got a tiny little bit of moisture in there. What's the problem? I'm heating it up. The oxygen's coming out. It's boiling out. No. The oxygen that's in there has got a very short diffusion path down to this steel. And corrosion can happen very easily. So thermal spray aluminum, for all its technical prowess, on the atmospheric side of the equation, where it's brilliant, unequivocally brilliant, it's got problems. Here. And the use of a polymeric liquid coating comes into the foreground and is particularly useful. Keeping all of that in mind, now, what are we going to do about it? Well, we apply in the facility this thermal spray aluminum, and we've decided to do it despite what I've just said technically. Okay, let's, let's think about that. So then when you apply this material, thermal spray aluminum, it's expensive. You have to have the right workers. You've got to have a, a work permit, hot permit, and so on and so forth. The, uh, the cost is quite high normally. The application rate is slow, and it's complex with areas of uh, difficult geometry. This one looked very easy, but if you had some protrusions getting inside there, you're not going to get inside this thing. And if this is not at a 90-degree angle so you can see at what you're doing, 
Now, an Oxbury aluminum is very difficult to apply it. And so with those difficulties in mind, it's not surprising that it's difficult to um, control the dry film thickness of the material, let alone putting on an SA3 white metal, deep profile, deeper than you'd have for a liquid coating, wouldn't you? These are some of the not insuperable problems, but they are difficult problems to deal with. And you have to deal with all of this uh, as you go, as well as the weather, as well as the people. And remember, I want you to think about this. The risk is proportional to one over the application uh, quality. If the application quality is not good, the risk is very big. And we asked ourselves, where's my least risk in getting the job done right? So on that basis, then, let's have a look at something else. We mentioned that there's a cold spray aluminum liquid applied coating. What is that? It's a two component material. It's based on silicone chemistry, SIO bonds. They're thermally tough, thermally strong and resistant, and they're very resistant to oxygen. We call it thermooxidative degradation to break down in the in the hot oxygenated atmosphere. And we're specifically talking about a material that has been available now for nearly 16 years. It's called CSA, as you've heard, but Intertherm 751 CSA. And it's an inert multipolymeric matrix. Fancy title. You'll see it in the NACE SPO 198 document, along with the thermal spray aluminum where you use it. And it's normally applied by a brush, spray, whatever. Yeah, very simple, very easy, in one coat. You can do two if you want to. 200 microns, it's sufficient. Many years ago, myself and my colleague Vijay Data, we decided to investigate it um, privately, shall we say, through third party independent inspections. And hence, we've written several papers on our research. It was quite phenomenal. And we compared and contrasted its abilities to protect steel under CUI conditions by mimicking CUI conditions and applying it side by side, perhaps like this, some with TSA, others with CSA. And that's what we did. So this material is two component, as I say, and can readily be applied in your maintenance mode on rusty steel, DST2, rusty steel, power tool, DST3, you get abrasive blast and get a good profile and away you go and you can apply one coat. And that's all our studies, all on one coat. I moved that because under here, I like to show you, this is the kind of thing we did. Many independent reports, a lot of them, looking at what we're talking about today. Just a one coat, eight mils DFT. You can put it on in adverse conditions and the interesting thing from my perspective is that it performs so much better than thermal spray aluminum in real life, as we have seen. And it doesn't introduce you to a lot of the problems that I've just been mentioning. And you can apply it in ambient temperatures. You can apply it on hot steel that's heated to 150 centigrade. If you do put it on rust, take off the loose the rust, of course, and make sure there's no uh, soluble salts there. We hate the ubiquitous chloride ions, don't we, which are so problematic for TSA. Get that off, and they're problematic for coatings too, but particularly TSA. We'll have a look at some pictures in a minute. And that's what you would do. So SA 751 was developed for maintenance minus 196C to 400C, as we have mentioned before. And now I'd like you to bear with me as I look down, because I have some paper here, and you're going to see shots up on the screen, where we deliberately went to see how do they compare when you apply them on a mimicked um, oil field or petrochemical facility um, result. What are you going to think? I'm getting a bit tongue-tied there. A little bit of the old Freudian stuff there. Bottom line is, how do they compare with each other? when you do the testing and is it uh, indicative, indicative 
funny word, of real time, real life service, and we're going to compare and contrast the May uh, results that way too. So if you look at the first slide, you'll see it says porosity of TSA versus the CSA 751 on carbon steel. We could, of course, and we did later, use austenitic stainless steel as well for some of our work. But what you'll see there on the left-hand side is something I didn't mention earlier to you. TSA is extremely porous. Here we say 10 to 20 percent, but it can range from 5 to 30 percent. And you have all the voids in this incredibly interesting scanning electron microscope backscatter image. And you have all these voids in there, and they're going to fill up with um, oxides and so on and so forth in our, in our service. But it's like a sieve. If we look at that TSA, and that's 100 magnification on the left at ambient temperature, um, it, became, it becomes like a sieve. It's already, yes, it's going to work as a sacrificial anode, but in terms of barrier properties, hmm. now, on the right-hand side of what you're looking at, you'll look at the CSA 751. It's a piece of literally this taken off after exposure to 400 centigrade. And it's a thousand magnification. You notice all those little squirrely things? What is that? Interlacing aluminum flake. It's a pigment. Interlacing aluminum flake. And because it interlaces, it gives great um, flexibility to that particular structure. Notice also, it's been at 400 degrees and no corrosion, no cracking, no blistering, no anything. It's actually very impressive. And it's going to perform extremely impressive in real life. So that overlapping array of aluminum flakes is very helpful. Somebody once said to me, Mike, it's like a battery, though. You put them in it. No good. And I said, with all due respect, you're wrong. Why are you wrong? The amount of aluminum inside there and the way it is, there's not enough aluminum touching each other and wriggling together, believe it or not, to set up what we call a perturbation network and where we, the degradation would be going on. Doesn't happen. It's not a battery. And the aluminum has got an oxide covering anyway. So you can well imagine from that picture, it's very hard for the intrusion of moisture, oxygen, chloride, so on and so forth, to get in there. But what we did was to make sure there was oxygen, moisture, chlorides in abundance when we did our testing. So let's go and have a look at our testing. The next slide, which you have there, I'm sure. The performance in a vertical pipe test. Now what this is, large piece of this, like you see, abrasive blasted the pipe, carbon steel. And as I said, we have done stainless. And we coat it. And then we insulate it from the top. You'll see it's insulated with cal steel. Well, why do we use that, not perlite or something? Well, because perl uh, perlite, sorry, um, cal steel will absorb moisture like crazy, 20, 30 times its own weight. So we want it to be bad. We want to set up bad conditions and see how well these things work. So then we coat it, insulate it, and you'll see it's put on top. And clad, of course, with aluminum foil in here, put on top of the hot plate. The hot plate is set at about 500 degrees. We simulate around about 450 centigrade all the way to the top, which is around 60 centigrade, and use thermocouples all the way up, which you don't see there, to measure the temperature of the steel vertically in this vertical pipe test. Then we pour in sodium chloride solution, simulating the horrible environment where you might get chloride being imbibed from even the insulation or from the exterior, the rainfall or whatever. So we make sure that we have a nasty solution of sodium chloride in there and we keep it on that hot plate for eight hours. Take it off, let it cool down, put more in, and we have a cycle which we won't go into, which takes 30, 30 odd days or 30 odd cycles, I should say, and it just keeps on going. So we have thermal cycling events going in here. We have thermal shock events happening in here. And then on the right-hand side, which you've been looking at because it's beautiful, 
you'll notice at the top the pipe CSA 751. On the right hand side, right at the end of that pipe, that's where it was sitting at around about 450 centigrade. And on the bottom, TSA, the comparative one. And you can see the difference between the CSA 751 and the TSA is not enormous, although the CSA 751 is, is superior. And just for interest, we included some other materials on some other pipe there, which you can see in the, say, 300 and 300 range to 450 range was not in the same class as the CSA 751, the cold spray aluminum. Thermal spray aluminum, we really have always liked, and that's why we chose it to be a benchmark for our testing. Inside of that structure, we've got dissolved oxygen, we've got chlorides, corrosives. So we've got corrodents, we've got corrosives, and we have this changing of temperature all the time. And we're constantly re resupplying the electrolyte. And so we concentrate um, some of the chlorides on there. So you can see for yourself just how well 751 TSA does against TSA. And it's a liquid applied coating without any of the hassles that you have applying the thermal metal spray, the thermal spray aluminum. So I thought you might find that very interesting. And then the last slide, I like to look at them, is a picture of real life 13 years on where we've had a propane treater. And you can see that when you look inside that window, how badly corroded it was. A brazier blasted out. You could have been water blasted, but it was a brazier blast. And then one coat of CSA 751 applied 13 years ago. And you can see it in the middle. Not a bad picture. The picture to the right is the same. No, it's not. It's taken another time going back inside the same area and finding out it's working extremely well. Well, in what way? We see the temperature changes from 40 centigrade up to 260 centigrade, to the best of my knowledge from what I've read, quite a lot. For years and years and years, you've got all sorts of cyclical uh, thermal events going on here. One coat, eight mils, CSA 751, and that's what you see going on. And it mimics what we see to some degree of what we had in the laboratory tests. And laboratory tests are indicators. They are a slice, and that particular test is profound. They're a slice of indication for us in real life exposures. What I didn't mention was that when you look at the testing that we did in the laboratory independently, and it's all independent stuff, we also did some other things, electrochemical impedance, spectroscopy, and so on and so forth. And I hope if you read our papers, you'll get to see all of that and enjoy it for yourselves. So as we close, let's have a quick recap of what we've got with the CSA 751 king of the castle over, unfortunately for TSA, no matter how brilliant it is for atmospheric conditions, certainly TSA not being the, the big kingpin for corrosion under insulation at all. And quite frankly, I have to say that in our industry, we think the jury is certainly out on the use of TSA in corrosion under insulation uh, regimes. So the recap, it's a single code application. It'll handle minus 196 up to 400 centigrade, and you can thermally cycle it, and it behaves beautifully. You've seen the reasons why. I'll let you dip into the SEMs at 1,000 magnification, because it's all insulating aluminum. It's not a battery. That's very interesting for those naysayers who say it is. It's safe. Everything's under the umbrella of safety. It's safe. You spray it. You can brush it. You can put it on in your maintenance programs. <clears throat> Excuse me on rusty conditions, rusty steel, clean it. And it could be power tool cleaned, hand tool cleaned, water blasted, and so on and so forth. And if you want to, you can apply it directly onto the um, thermal spray aluminum welded areas as a touch up and repair and so on and so forth. We also did that because it can be a seal coat in that little area. Do not seal coat everything. That's another topic. For another on the TSA. Your CUI budgets will be reduced significantly if you adopt this technology. Bold statement. We started with Carl. What did Carl say? 
uh, proofs and claims. The proof is it's been out there for 16 years and doing brilliantly. And what we talked about today, in a way, is like a claim in a sense. Why? Because I think of this as being like a fillet, min- not, no, 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 appetizer for you to hopefully engage and enjoy it. The fillet mignon is reading those papers that we've written. And I hope you enjoy that too, because with the track record being so good and CSA 751, Gold Spray Aluminum, being the king of the castle in the CUI realm with maintenance and repair, I hand it to you to read and enjoy. And thank you for joining me today. I've enjoyed it myself. Take care and all the best to you. Bye-bye.